live. And good evening, everybody on Facebook Live and on Zoom webinars. Welcome to the continuation of our AMS's uh, webinar expert series delivered to you by Zoom and, um, and Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us. Today is April 21st. We are um, uh, going to be sharing with you a continuation of uh, information on the latest that we know on COVID-19 in a multidisciplinary fashion. We are going to, uh, uh, on each episode, share information from experts from all over the world, uh, some who are on the very front lines, to help us better understand and better prepare ourselves, our practices, our loved ones, our communities, and so that we can best take care of our, our patients. Um, I'd like to thank our CME committee for um, organizing these um, dynamic discussions on the latest. Also our leadership, uh, Armenian American Medical Society's leadership, our president, Dr. Kevin Galstian, who's been very instrumental in making these sessions happen. Uh, tonight, we our focus uh, is gonna change. We are gonna be talking about uh, surgical aspects of COVID-19, and we have a great panel of uh, speakers. Um, and we're gonna touch on surgical aspects from the standpoint of anesthesia uh, and preparing uh, the operating room from an anesthesiologist standpoint. And also we're gonna talk about pre-op, intra-op, and post-op considerations when we're preparing patients uh, for surgery. Um, just to let you know, we have upcoming events uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're gonna have two pedi pediatricians who are gonna be discussing uh, various aspects of COVID-19 care in the pediatric population but every parent should know uh, in regards to how to, uh, how to proceed in this era with routine pediatric appointments, with COVID su suspect appointments, and what expectations of change there are in the, in the everyday practice of pediatrics. Um, also, there is CME and CDE credits offered. So for anybody who wants to claim those credits for these educational programs, you can go to our website, aamsc.org, and you will find a tab uh, where you, ta you take the, uh, the answer the questionnaire and uh, you can claim your CME credits. Uh, in most events, we're offering two CME credits. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker tonight. Our first speaker is from the Cleveland Clinic, uh, a good friend of mine, a you know, a very uh, active and engaged uh, internationally renowned uh, professor of anesthesia. It's Dr. Rafi Abitisian, who is a professor of anesthesiology in the Department of General Anesthesiology at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. He's also the past president of the Society for Neuroscience in the Anesthesiology and Critical Care. He's an American Board of Anesthesiologists Applied Examiner as well as a member of the Association of University Anesthesiologists and the recipient of the ASA SEA Distinguished Education Award. His academic interests in mostly in brain tumors, um, anesthetic methods of seizure surgery, brain protection and outcomes of spine surgery, as well as difficult airway management. His clinical studies are mostly directed to finding ways to improve the outcomes of surgery after neurosurgical procedures. He's also interested in medical innovation with many filed and published patents. He has about 40 published peer reviewed manuscripts, two book chapters and many abstract presentations um, and has many, many academic achievements. He's um, on the editorial board of the Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesiology and Journal of Anesthesiology, Clinical Pharmacology, and an ad hoc reviewer for anesthesiology, anesthesia, analgesia, world neurosurgery journal, and International Anesthesia Research Society annual meetings. Um, 
Rafi is also very, very much involved in uh, various aspects of healthcare in Armenia. He's part of the Stroke Initiative Task Force that is, uh, advises the Ministry of Health and has been instrumental in uh, causing many changes in the, uh, in the care of stroke in Armenia. With that, I'm gonna invite Dr. Avetisian to take over the screen. Please, uh, Dr. Avetisian, uh, enable your video. And I'd like to uh, share, uh, ask you to take over the screen and take it away from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vigen, and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, um, let me start sharing the uh, uh, the screen. Um, just begin. Give me a confirmation that you can hear me and you can see the screen. Yes, we we can see you, hear you, perfect. Thank you very much. Again, thank you very much for the uh, Armenian American Medical Society and uh, Dr. Sepelian for the invitation and dear Hasmik for coordinating everything. And I would really like to thank you all for participating and being interested to hear this uh, presentation. Um, uh, the, the talk is going to be the anesthesiologist rule during uh, COVID-19. I do not have any financial uh, conflicts to disclose for this presentation. Um, and the objectives that we would like to uh, reach together is uh, to be familiar with the role of an anesthesiologist during a pandemic, any pandemic. And you understand the adaptability that we have to have towards the needs uh, when a an, uh, an pandemic comes up. We have to identify the leadership role for an intensivist and an anesthesiologist and uh, recognize the occupational hazards of the anesthesiologists during a pandemic. Now, um, I'm going to start with a history of what the anesthesiologists are, because I know that there is a wide variety of participants, not all of them are anesthesiologists or even uh, uh, surgical colleagues in the, on this call. Um, and not all of us during the med school did go to the rotation of anesthesiologists. So as far as the history, it's not that far of a, uh, um, a specialty. It's about what, in 1846 in October, it was the first anesthesiology uh, a procedure done by a dentist for, for, for in, uh, in uh, the Mass General Hospital where there were two surgeries a week was being conducted because there was no anesthesia involved. Now, as in a center like Cleveland Clinic, we have 770 cases a day of uh, procedures. Um, now, the, the, the important thing is the uh, science of anesthesiology has evolved and the scope of practice has gone into the, more like the science of consciousness and pain and the intensive care with many subspecialties coming up, including intensive care, including pain management, neuro anesthesia, cardiac anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, and so on and so forth. And even beyond the clinical care, it's the OR management or the management of situations that uh, near, uh, need dire attention and intensive care. Um, so if, if we come to see what anesthesia is, in, if we can, can translate that into four things, it's the uh, causing the unconsciousness, treating the pain, causing a muscle relaxation, and getting rid of the memory where the patient really does not need the memory, as well as the acute hemodynamic changes that we have. So when do we need an anesthesiologist or an intensivist? Well, first of all, it's in during the routine life and operations of the hospital, like uh, the daily clinical work in the OR that we have, as well as nowadays it's the OR management that's with the anesthesiologist. Surgical colleagues do their work and they have to go back to their clinic and see the patients. We live in the operating room. The next thing is disaster planning, as well as uh, uh, high emergency situations. In the United States, we have the option of having emergency medical specialty, which is really very close to anesthesiology. In some countries, it's not like that. For example, in Europe, it's the anesthesiologists who, who run the uh, emergency room and, in fact, are the, in the ambulance or life flights when there, there is an, a disaster coming. Now, with the disasters coming, there should be an adaptations as well to uh, uh, shift the needs uh, and the practice of anesthesiology towards that. And one of them is the pandemic. So if there is any innovations with the change that's happening, we need an anesthesiologist to have a plan B 
and the plan C if something goes wrong and if that one goes wrong as well. So we need someone uh, who would be fast and work in an intense situation. Now coming to the coronavirus, um, well, the leading um, uh, cause of death in the United States is heart disease and after that is cancer, it's the accidental injuries, so on and so forth. This, uh, uh, the graph shows um, the, the uh, role of coronavirus in death in the United States. If we go to the lower end of estimates with 2.1% of death, we are above uh, the end, of the above number eight, about diabetes. And with a higher end of estimates, it's about 200,000, which goes all the way up as the third cause of death right now in the United States. However, unfortunately, this is a graph from uh, 20th of uh, April. Now, today, the graph has changed. And if you see the red line is the COVID-19 coming from March 24, 25, 26, 27, going all the way to 20th. Now, unfortunately, it's the number one cause of death right now. So uh, this is a big change. We have to adapt. We need the help of some people who can work in an intense and fast situation. I'm going to talk about Northeast Ohio census and the impact of relaxation of the social distancing. So in the graph below, you see the green line, and that is if we have the 40% social distancing that we recommended right now. And you would see about 13, 14, 15 of June, we will have a surge that's going to go about 2,500 to 3,000 deaths. But if we really lose everything down to 0% of social distancing, and that's going to be the blue line, we're going to have about 7,500 or 8,000 deaths, unfortunately, in the coming 45 days. So what are the, the, uh, the important roles that we have to come back and keep in, in account with that high intensity death? What are we going to do with the routine operations? Everyday life, people do get sick. Some of them need a surgical procedure. What are we going to do with those? So the, the, the question is to do them or not to do them. Now that's the approach that we have in mind in Cleveland Clinic in Northeast Ohio is to go towards the phased approach of opening up to different surgical procedures. And I will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But the adaptation that we have to do as anesthesiologists is to look at the workforce. What we do in the Cleveland Clinic is the redeployment, meaning everyone has to operate at the level that they know underneath the control or underneath the, uh, uh, the leadership of the ones who are treating the, um, the, uh, 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 the coronavirus infected people. So at the top of this, uh, 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 a column is the, the, the uh, intensivist uh, um, in the bronchoscopy suite as well as the anesthesiology intensivist. None of them, there are the different hospitalists, uh, it's infectious disease uh, 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 specialists, even the surgeons. So all of them have gone to medical school and every one of them have to work in a team led by the uh, intensivist to help uh, those patients who are in dire situations. The next thing is the environment. Which hospital are we working in? Are they able to accept people in the ICU? Uh, are some hospitals changed to the centers that take care of uh, our COVID patients? Or are they going to be, uh, go back to the original um, pre-COVID-19 surgical procedures? We have to have a dedicated resource for each operation, be it COVID or not COVID. And that goes into manpower, personal protective equipment, uh, uh, medications, as well as specialties that go around for the uh, surgical procedures that we have to uh, conduct. Now that goes also with the coordination with the regional state as well as national needs. Now this is a photo of a, a couple of days ago when a, 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 a group from Cleveland Clinic went to New York because in a national level, that was the, the, the place that really needed it. And some of our anesthesiologists did go there. Today, I heard 
that they need uh, in a global uh, manner. Uh, some some specialists in the Cologne Clinic Abu Dhabi that we uh, uh, may be deployed there. Coming back to what a phased approach is. So when if we open up for routine um, uh, cases which are non-emergent, we have to go by a phase. And the phase one is the ambulatory surgical services. Why? There's a big backlog of these pa patients. And these patients have very limited exposures. It's not that they're going to come into the hospital, be hospitalized. The examples of them are colonoscopies, hysteroscopies, outpatient eye surgeries. Then it goes to subspecialty centers that we have in the clinic. And that's also a large backlog of patients that have been waiting because of the coronavirus that cannot come in. As I said, our operative uh, procedures have decreased to 25%. We just do about 180 cases a day, and that's down from 770. But just examples of those are ortho cases, spine cases. Um, and then the phase three are the, the big hospitalizations that can, can really need a lot of resources. For example, DD donors, intracranial non-emergency or urgent procedures that they have to come in, have this procedure, go in, in a, on a floor and be there for some time. And the, these are the ones that are more exposed and can expose the healthcare and caregivers. So on a routine basis, before the COVID happened, we had a preoperative evaluation clearance of, of patients before they go to the surgery. Now we have to adapt for it. That also goes for the PACE clinic, which is the preoperative anesthesia uh, clinic uh, uh, for, for uh, patients, as well as the internist office, which is the impact office. Then from there, we send to the consults, for example, the cardiac consult or a knowledge consult. Now this is the routine. This is the pre-COVID era. What is the adaptation? Now we have to look at which patients are inpatients, came through emergency room, do not or don't appear to have a COVID, uh, but they, they need an urgent operation versus patients who are outpatient, but they also need to have an operation. In here, it comes uh, 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 in light the role of telemedicine, how we can contact with these patients and do the preoperative clearance or preoperative evaluation with these patients. Uh, Colonel Clinic, we do have this uh, free app right now that each uh, patient can get into contact with their physician, the anesthesiologist, as well as the internist to be cleared for the surgery. Now, there are things that are possible. There are things that are missing there. What about the physical exam? Some of them you can do virtually. Like, for example, I can do an airway exam just looking at the uh, uh, at the, uh, the camera that the patient is looking at it. But some of them we have to do at, on the day of surgery, live, like listening to the lungs. I can't listen to the lungs through a, a virtual um, uh, manner. That may increase some, in, increase some of the uh, day of surgery cancellations because I don't know if the patient is wheezing or not. However, we have made it much easier for patients to go to remote labs or radiology centers or testing centers, and they can quickly send us all the results that we need. Coming to the COVID testing, if we go to this uh, phasing opening up of routine surgery, we do have a rapid testing, which is within a, a, a few uh, hours. And those are for the emergency cases or the urgent cases within the 24 hour and that we cannot wait. The patient is not asymptomatic, we have to go. And they go under the rapid testing. The other ones will be going on the, the routine testing, which may take a day, but that's the day before the procedure. And we are then sure that this patient is negative and will bring less of a risk or need less of a resources uh, other than the specialty COVID operating room that we have. We do have to have an intraoperative precautions. That goes into the induction of anesthesia, meaning putting the patient to sleep, um, the way that we uh, manage the airway and even the medications. We have to be conscious about the, uh, the uh, medications that we use for anesthesia because these are almost the same medications that we have to use to sedate the patients who are intubated in the ICU for COVID. So we are sooner or later going to go with a shorter of this medication. So that is what, how we have to adapt and use other medications that are acceptable causing uh, uh, unconsciousness, but they are not the ones that are being used, for example, propofol for uh, sedation of patients. 
The airway management, I will discuss more. There are certain uh, changes that we have done for airway management, as well as safety of other personnel in the operating room. For example, in our central, everyone goes out of the operating room except for the anesthesiologist and the, uh, the, the system, which could be a nurse anesthetist, uh, an AA, or a resident. And they are the ones that staying in the, uh, the operating room doing the airway management because we are the closest to the airway. Uh, and there's a, the highest chance that we can get the COVID from the patients. We don't want anyone else to get it. There are some centers that they even wait 20 minutes because, before they let the surgeon back in. And this also goes to the nature of surgery. Some of the surgeries we really, really have to go close to the airway of the patient, including transphenomenal surgeries, including ENT surgeries, those which are around the face. However, the, the risk lessens which when the patient is already intubated by the anesthesiologist because the aerosols would not come out. There are certain setups that we have to do for the operating room, including uh, uh, putting everything that we may need during the case in a close proximity because we don't want to go and touch with the, uh, the gloves, uh, the, the uh, medications or equipment that are going to be used for the next patient. Double gloving and changing the outer glove is also another change that we have done on the OR set. The post-operative issues goes to the destination where the patient is going to be, as well as the problems with transporting these patients. Some of the patients need to go to post-anesthesia care unit or what we call the recovery room. Now, if you take a patient which is COVID positive to your recovery room, they're going to make the rest of the patients um, uh, uh, prone to uh, catching the virus. So we sometimes need to, to uh, recover the patients in the operating room with all those masks and PPEs and everything before we go to the ICU or the uh, floor. During the transport, it's better to go with a, a ventilator rather than a mask uh, ventilation because that decreases the chance of, um, of uh, spreading the virus. Uh, we need some sedation during the transport, which is another problem. There are pain management modalities have changed to decrease towards those who have an in, in increased risk of the proceduralist getting the uh, uh, virus compared to um, other modes of uh, pain management, including an, an IV patient control, controlled anesthesia. We also would like the patients to go home as soon as they can because a hospital is not a safe place to be when there's a lot of coronaviruses. Now, for specific cases, there are certain consistent statements. One of them, as you can see in here, is endorsed by Society of Vascular International Neurology, put up by Society of Neuroscience and uh, Anesthesia, and Neuroscience and Anesthesia and Critical Care, for which I, I'm still on the, the, the uh, executive council. Um, this is this consensus statement of telling about those who may or may not have COVID, but they're coming with stroke. And if they're in stroke, there's no time for you to check if they do or do not have a coronavirus. There's no time for you to even ask them if they have the symptoms because they may not be able to talk. So there's a statement for this specific case, um, as well as an algorithm for it explained. The other right now newly coming out is the neuroanesthesia practice, which is my practice, when there is COVID-19 and what are the recommendations with all the neurosurgical and spine procedures as well as neurointerventional that goes with that. The Soci American Society of Anesthesiologists in association with the, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, nurse anesthetist, anesthesia assistant has put up a statement saying that ideally anesthesia professionals should use properly fitted N95 masks for all cases. Believe me, it's not that easy to wear that mask the whole day, but it is what it is. Now for the PPE, is it available for everyone or not? That, that's a very important uh, question. How much is it in, available? Nowadays in our center, we all get one mask and that's the mask you get until the whole day is done, unless it gets dirty and then you can change it because there is a limited uh, uh, supply of it. There should be a standardization for each region on how to uh, use the, the protective equipment. There should be an education as well as practice and simulation. It is not comfortable, but it should be become comfortable because that's how we are going to uh, uh, work and uh, help the patient. Now, who gets to have what goes back to the availability 
as well as how we can uh, distribute it between those who are in very close contact with the patients. This, in fact, has brought up some nice innovations. We have to identify the needs, and that brings up to problem-solving uh, nature that we have uh, as, as a specialty. We, um, we have our assistance with the engineers, biomedical engineers, and the Infectious Control Prevention Committee with some feedback from the users, and we have come up with some methods. For example, this halo that covers the face of the patients at the time of intubation. Uh, the other one that I have come up with is a, is a foldable uh, um, uh, frame that you can put a cover on it and uh, be safer uh, when you're managing the airway. I just had a, an email from one of my friends, an Armenian uh, anesthesiologist from Spain that has come up with this method of uh, a, a, a positive pressure um, even without using a bag mask, with just the flow of oxygen, uh, with using coins, uh, I think there are five cents or 10 cent euro coins, and each one of them has a special centimeter of water pressure that they can increase. Uh, this is one that came in Armenia after some recommendations there in Arapkir Center with a, 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 a method of carrying the transporting patients with a, a less of a chance of. Um, being exposed. However, let's go back to COVID and uh, what is the anesthesiologist's role? Anesthesia is in fact the applied physiology or applied pharmacology action, and that's what, what an anesthesiologist is. Airway management is one of the things that we do, and you cannot get closer to the mouth of a patient uh, when, uh, uh, unless you do an airway management. We are also the uh, monitoring specialties and the division of respiratory therapy is in fact a subdivision of the, the uh, Anesthesiology Institute. So is our close cooperation with other specialties that are involved in COVID treatment, including infectious disease, nutrition, renal supporting, cardiologists. But one important thing for every center is guidelines and the guidelines and the guidelines. And we have specialty guidelines that all of us on a daily basis read and reread to be um, familiar uh, and a team-based uh, practice of our uh, patients. We even have a cheat sheet of uh, the ICU management. So how do these uh, COVID patients present? They come with fever and cough, fatigue, GI symptoms, and the important point, and I heard we were just talking before everyone came on, of the fast acute decompensation that sometimes these patients have to sometimes script with dyspnea when their saturation starts dropping to 92, 90%, and all of a sudden the lungs get flooded and they get this uh, acute respiratory distress symptom in very short uh, period of time. That's when you do need uh, uh, an expert in um, uh, airway management to be able to um, get the airway and uh, intubate the patient. So. Um, severe pneumonia comes with fever, severe dyspnea, respiratory dyspnea. You see attack hypnia patients breathing fast more than 30 times a minute, and then with that hypoxia with the saturation less than 90% on room air, and that's when you have to start going up on your oxygen. Now, even respiratory distress symptoms has different levels. There's the mild, moderate, and severe situation, and that goes with uh, dividing the uh, oxygen partial pressure in the blood to the fractional uh, 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 oxygen, uh, oxygen content of the air that we do. So if we give a patient 100% oxygen, all oxygen, non rebreathed nothing else in it, and you still have a PaO2 of less than 100 millimeter mercury, you're in a really dire situation with severe uh, with, uh, ARDS. Now, in some centers, you do not have the PaO2. Using us, uh, the saturation to FiO2 less than 315 would be your indication of going into ARDS. So what are the treatments? Accordingly, each center has their own protocol. I'm just going to go through the protocol that we have. And there's different, all accepted variations of it. We do a frequent assessment in, a, in ARDS treatment every four hours. We adjust the ventilator set, uh, uh, settings according to the graph we have, which looks at the positive index respiratory pressure peak, as well as the, uh, uh, the oxygen content that we're giving, the FiO2. We have to optimize the fluids because these patients may have high or even low 
uh, uh, central venous pressure because they may be overloaded or not, according to how the heart works. Uh, saturation goes about 88 up to 93, 95% of oxygen. Sometimes that doesn't work. We have to go out to adjunct therapy by positioning the patient in prone position uh, or, or using extracorporeal me uh, membrane oxygenation, which is really, really um, down the line. Prone positioning in our center right now is an uh, intubated patient. I was talking to Armenian. They were doing prone positioning on high pronasal oxygen, which apparently they did work very well for them. Uh, uh, we, but we do not have that um, experience in here yet. There is cardiac involvement as well. There uh, may be a 19 to 28% of hospitalized patients may get acute cardiac injury with hydroponics. And uh, you may think that this may just make it a heart attack. And some of them do. Acute coronary symptoms is one of the presentations. And in fact, I heard one of the uh, deaths that uh, happened in Yerevan was because of acute coronary syndrome that they could not uh, stent the patient. There's also a chance of arrhythmias. So about 6 to 17% of hospitalized patients and about 44%, that's about half of patients in the ICU that uh, get arrhythmias. And that may be because of electrolyte disturbances or the myocarditis itself. These patients may get pericarditis and myocarditis, and you would see their ejection fraction dropping. And that, that uh, brings up the good point of point of care ultrasound that you can do uh, quickly in the ICU and see what their ejection fraction is. Coagulopathy is another problem that comes with these patients with severely elevated deep dimers and elevated fibrinogen levels, but they also have high thrombotic complications in the, uh, the veins the, uh, and everywhere else, including the heart. Uh, venous thromboembolosis uh, embolysis is uh, very much dependent on the dimer levels, and they still do recommend uh, the uh, treatments and prevention of the VT because this is another killer in the ICU. Coming to fluids, one of the uh, most important things to know is uh, central venous pressure. Not everyone at the center does have the luxury of getting the line in or anesthesiologists or intensivists have to go and put the line in for them. But it is a good standard of knowing what their um, um, uh, fluid status is by dividing it in a higher eight millimeter mercury, four to eight or less than four. And according to this protocol, you can uh, give them either fluid just watch them or give them a diuretic to see if the kidneys are going to come back. Um, this is, again, one of the protocols that we use. It's not the only protocol, but it's a protocol that's accepted. The role of point of care ultrasound is more judicial use, so much that, in fact, in our center, we, we recommend not using the stethoscope to view the lungs, but just to look at, at the lungs with an ultrasound, which is either easier to clean or cover with a sheet. And uh, instead of uh, listening to the lung, you can do that. We have developed an acute, um, uh, uh, acute team for intubations uh, during a COVID called the acute COVID uh, um, anesthesia team, which are called uh, when there is a need for intubation of a patient rapidly and the ICU cannot handle it. Uh, the airway management protocols have changed. The resuscitation protocols have changed. The responsibility of this ACAP team is primarily to get emergent intubation, but also to get the central line access, arterial light placement, intraosis access, OG placement, ventilator, initial uh, 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 setup and management, and hemodynamic stabilization and resuscitation, as well as assistance in the ICU as needed because they are the acute care physicians. They do have to have their own uh, personal uh, protective equipment with them with a medication box, intubating kit, line bags and ventilators. Now, intubation protocols have changed, as I said. Now, we do create oxygen with 100% uh, FiO2, but we do not uh, in, uh, initiate non-invasive ventilation because that increases the chance of aerosolization of the secretions. We do all rapid sequence. So we do not ventilate when the patient is asleep. We make sure that we go quickly and put the tube in as fast as we can with no bag mask ventilation. And after that, we confirm the intubation with entitled CO2 uh, as soon as we intubate and put the filter on. And again, instead of auscultation with the stethoscope, we look at the long ultrasound. The resuscitations have changed. Previously, the patient was coded, everyone ran into the room. Now you cannot go into the room unless you put your PPEs on, you move inside. The first thing you do is cover the patient's face and start your ACLS and jump 
and do the resuscitation of the chest compression. If we do not do the rescue breath, we intubate as soon as possible. And if we do have those automatic compression devices, we do that. Unfortunately, there are times that you have to decide on termination of efforts, including a cardiopulmonary arrest patients uh, 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 that you cannot bring them back. And these are not candidates for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And physicians are not ethically obligated to deliver care if they see that in their best professional judgment, they will not have a reasonable chance of benefiting patients. And the prolonged heroic resuscitation efforts are not recommended. That causes some psychological problems with the physicians, anesthesiologists, and intensivists. There is a high risk of contamination, as I said, for anesthesiologists. We are very close to the map. We do have our own family loved ones. And some of them we, we just can't go and see quite that often. And we're really scared for bringing something and in, 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 in infecting them. The notion of self-sacrifice we have always had have to be put aside because we really have to think that we should survive to help other patients. There is a change of a patient from an individual to community. And that, that brings to a physical wellness and psychological stress that we have in anesthetic people as well as the ICU people, and the resources for help. In that common clinic, there are resources that have given us some websites for re relaxation, some websites to uh, know what to do. Thank God, fortunately, we're not as bad as some other places like Italy, like uh, Spain, like New York. Uh, but all of those who are really close in taking care of these patients are really, really in high stress. The tips for success for while working at home is part of the uh, caregiver uh, recommendations. Support of health and well-being by wellness resources, website that you can go and visit, guides for meditation, and also appreciate and encourage each other. I did uh, recommend um, to come up and recognize some of the heroes that have been working on front line in Armenia, as well as in New York, as well as in Glendale, as well as in other places, we really have to uh, show our gratitude in the practice for them. In the end, I want to tell you about the resources for caregivers, the housing program that we have in our clinic. And for those who cannot go back home because they have a vulnerable person there, we do give housing programs for them. There are support groups, employee wellnesses, there is an office uh, for caregiver experience and words of encouragement. We do give each other every day um, and hope that uh, they, they do their best to take care of the patients. I would like to thank you again for listening and thank the American, Armenian American Medical Society to give me the opportunity. If anyone has any questions, uh, I guess, I don't know if it's this the time now or at the end of the second speaker, but there's my email written there. Please go ahead and, and send me your questions. I'll be more than happy to, uh, to, to help. Let me see how I can stop the sharing all back to you again. Thank you so much. Rafi, thank you very much for that, uh, you know, presentation. If you can stay with us, it'd be great if we take questions at the end. However, if you have to go, we understand the questions now. No, I can stay, thank you. Okay, great, great. Then we'll we'll uh, go ahead and move to our second speaker. Our second speaker is a, a physician who is very um, uh, very familiar to us, very well known to us. He is one of our board members, Dr. Garni Barhudarian. Dr. Barhudarian is a graduate of UCLA, uh, and he received his medical education at the University of Michigan Medical School. He completed his neurosurgical residency at UCLA Medical Center. And then he completed the fellowship in pituitary and neuroendoscopy um, with Dr. Edward Laws at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, he's a member of the American Academy of uh, Neurologic Surgeons, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, the International Society of Pituitary Surgeons, and the Armenian American Medical Society. We're proud to have him as a a uh, board member. He is um, the treasurer of the organization. He serves on the uh, continuing medical education committee as well. Um, and with that, I am going to invite Dr. Barakhudarian to please come and take uh, over the screen. 
if everybody else can shut off their videos and then I'll uh, invite Dr. Barhudarian to um, come up and take over the platform. Uh, thank you, Viken. I am trying to see if this is working here. Um, are you able to see my presentation? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, well, thank you very much, Viken. And uh, uh, in particular, it's uh, really an honor to be paired with Dr. Avetisian, who um, we've, we've uh, encountered many times uh, here and in Armenia. So it's been a pleasure to be on your, your panel, Rafi, and um, hopefully uh, we'll have more encounters like this. Uh, I uh, noticed, uh, given your talk, that there's a lot of overlap with what I'll be talking about. As you can imagine, a lot of the COVID issues uh, stem around operations management and how anesthesia is handled. But I think I'll do some deeper dives into uh, some of the uh, nuances within the surgical side of, of that discussion. So uh, without further ado, these are my disclosures, none of which are relevant for this talk, with one exception that this is really how we're starting to look at each other at home. And I'm sure others are, are feeling this uh, with the stay at home situation that we are all living in. Um, this is the outline of our, our discussion today. We'll talk about our current status just briefly. Um, we'll talk a little bit about in the acute phase where we are right now, how we're screening patients, how we're selecting patients for surgery. Then we'll talk about how we're protecting our caregivers uh, in the operating room and outside. And then finally, and I'll, I'll spend some time on this, is the resumption of elective cases, this recovery phase, which uh, we're starting to already hear some murmurs about uh, in the surrounding communities. So here, here we are. These are numbers uh, from late last night, and I think they're uh, pretty up to date. Uh, certainly, uh, this is a global pandemic, and everybody is involved. Everybody is affected, and uh, I don't think there's really any separation. Uh, of course, U.S. being uh, number one is, uh, again, what's what we're seeing here. U.S. is number one in the number of affected cases. Uh, but many other uh, developed and underdeveloped countries are still um, suffering the uh, conditions of COVID. And I think there's a lot of challenges in understanding how things are with regards to how things are being measured as well as reported. Uh, so a lot more to learn over the next uh, few months and years. This is just a, a timeline uh, of how things have been. You can see here, um, this was China. China took care of its, its crisis very succinctly and swiftly. And then here we are, all of our uh, other nations here that are dealing with COVID uh, are starting to see hopefully uh, the beginnings of a plateau and, and a flattened curve, but certainly being affected significantly uh, across the board. Uh, this is the current infection uh, rate across the country. And you can see that the virus tends to congregate in highly um, populated regions, Southern California, the Northeast, Florida, and um, parts of Texas and Seattle. And of course, the death rate correlates with this, although there are some var uh, variances here as well. But this is an interesting set of curves I'll show you. This is the current uh, curve of the United States. This is the infection rate of the total number of people infected, and we're uh, approaching 800,000 people infected. And you're starting to see somewhat of a, a hint of a plateau as we get to the top here. However, this varies from state to state. And I think it has to do with what phase we are within this crisis and this pandemic. And you'll see that some of the East Coast states tend to be a little bit more advanced than some, some of the West Coast states. So California is still on the incline, whereas we're starting to see a plateau uh, starting to form in Michigan maybe and then in New York, we're already starting to see a dip down, uh, same with Massachusetts. So hopefully this is a sign that the, the measures that we're doing are helpful and we're, we're, trying to, we're starting to make some headway here, but I'll talk a little bit more about what this really means. So pretty much what it should uh, enforce is that we should stay at home. We should follow these rules that have been implemented by the government uh, and all of our leaders uh, locally and, and regionally. 
Um, I know it's challenging and we've all faced our own issues. And um, while these aren't my kids, I've certainly had the urge to do that to my kids um, uh, from time to time with their cabin fever developing. But I think it, it's very helpful because we're able to see some uh, efforts, uh, uh, the fruits of our efforts. So we know that the social distancing, or as um, Dr. Kaftarian mentioned, the physical distancing really, it, it does work. The curve is flattening. And that helps us because it helps us uh, meet our resources to the demand uh, with the supply chain that were, was uh, significantly lagging. It helps us better understand our treatment options. And, and of course, we heard a lot about this from our infectious disease colleagues as to how to handle these patients, both in the critical phase and also potentially in the earlier phases of their illness. And also, uh, this has allowed uh, for increased time for development of clinical trials. I'm happy to say that our hospital has been a, uh, a number, has a number of trials active and, and we're able to roll them out very rapidly, uh, partly thanks to the government allowing to uh, loosen some of the restrictions there. Uh, and this gave a lot of uh, patients the opportunity to get uh, different types of care and, and of course us to learn from that type of, uh, of, of care paradigms. But there are some drawbacks. The flattened curve, the flatter curve, means a longer duration of the pandemic. So it's not like it was in China, where it's very short and succinct. We're going to see a much longer curve. And this has, of course, economic implications, which we are all feeling, as well as our patients are going to have issues with delay of care uh, for their subacute and chronic issues, which we uh, will talk a little bit more about when we talk about reopening uh, care. And then, of course, you have the opposite side of the world. People who are deniers, um, they're uh, blatantly uh, ignoring the state of home mandate. And this is uh, on our West Coast beaches here just very recently. This is in Michigan with a traffic jam that they created as a protest to stay at home. And then, of course, even in, in Huntington Beach, they've made it a politicized issue and think that COVID is really a, a political aspect, which it's not. But I would recommend that we should focus on staying at home and uh, doing productive things. For example, my, my cousin who had his kids make us some face shields when, when the uh, equipment was not even available. I think these are more productive ways to spend our time. So I'll shift into where we are now, uh, where we have been and where we're going forward. So this was a letter published by the U uh, UCSF group, a neurosurgical group, um, just a, a couple of uh, weeks ago, it was circulated ahead of press, and, and there they had a nice protocol how to ramp down as the COVID pandemic was starting to come into play. And you can see this uh, surge level scheme that they have here, green being a low uh, exposure in the community, few inpatients having COVID uh, testing positive, yellow being an intermediate and red being very high and then the black which we haven't experienced yet on the west coast but um, they're already very significantly being experienced on the east coast in new york in particular is when we're um, already having manpower shortage and we need to have other people come in and fill in um, you can see that it didn't take long to get to more than 100 community cases so this was a very rapid ramp down and everything quickly shut down. And it, of course, affected not only the way we handle our patients in the hospital, but uh, how things are, are happening um, across the board. And, and this all was happening just in the beginning where we were still, still learning about the pandemic. This was when we were comparing ourselves to Italy and how no way it could be like Italy. Uh, and, and of course, we've, we've well surpassed that. But interestingly, there were some other tactics that were um, put into place that actually was very helpful. So for example, this is a rotation schedule at their different hospitals for their residency, um, for their residents in the residency program. And this allowed the residents to alternate days or alternate shifts so that if they did get exposed, they wouldn't have the full team affected and, and there would be a backup team and a redundancy to, to work. And this actually is a, is a great scheme. We've implemented this at our, our center which, where we do not have a residency program, but we have physicians taking care of similar patients and we're able to alternate so that we're not A, exposing each other and B, if one of us gets sick, then the other can still continue to take care of our, our patients. 
So I'll, I'll give you a, a timeline of our ramp down at Providence St. Joseph's um, Health System, and in particular at St. John's Health Center, which, which is where I practice primarily. Uh, and Providence is a 50 plus hospital health system and, and really have come full force how to tackle this problem on all levels. And we'll touch a little bit about this. So this is a, an early timeline that shows what was going on in China. Um, the, the genome was identified. Uh, uh, patients were being identified and, and tested finally. And then it started to spread outside of China into Europe and uh, Middle East and, and et cetera. Uh, but this is what uh, is likely ha had happened at that time. They traced it back to a patient who contracted this virus in November of last year. The first US patient uh, was thought to be contracted in January 22nd. By March 5th, there were only 164 uh, infected patients that, that we knew of in the United States. And uh, by this time, there was already well uh, awareness within our system. We had a policy to screen patients with symptoms and travel history. Surgical masks, though, were only for providers and not for everybody in the office. Uh, the lab test to confirm coronavirus is very slow, and it was a send out to uh, only a few centers in the whole country. And so we had a three to five day turnaround time to get our results. Uh, and of course, uh, the PPE cons conservation tactics were started at that time. March 6th, uh, work furloughs were being discussed. We started to do telemedicine. This was before the CMS codes were introduced that uh, Dr. Apelian had discussed very nicely, um, but we were still starting to tell patients to start to stay away. And um, um, we were implementing telephone and video conferences. Um, by March 10th, almost 1,000 people infected. Visitation rights uh, were limited for patients and their family members in the hospital, both as an inpatient and an, as an outpatient. And that was actually initially met with a lot of frustration and challenges, although I think it's become more well accepted now. Um, by March 12th, we electively canceled our uh, operations, or we voluntarily canceled our elective operations, excuse me. And we started to actively screen everybody entering into the hospital. Um, by March 14th, the CDC and the WHO confirmed that this was actually a droplet uh, transmission and uh, we needed more than just simple surgical face masks. And so the PPE was recommended for uh, N95 respirators for any aerosol generating procedures. Uh, the next day, LA County imposed the stay at home uh, orders and uh, work at home for all non-essential employees were initiated at our health system. The next day, LAOSD canceled all their classes and all of the students rejoiced. All of the parents did not rejoice in this process. Uh, and LA County went in a lockdown. By the March 19th, we had tents outside our hospital building, anticipating a huge surge, which actually still has not come yet. And um, by March 20th, and this will be something we'll talk a little bit more about in a, in a second, and something Dr. Avitisian mentioned, Anecdotal reports suggested that endonasal operations had high transmission rates for caregivers in the operating room. Um, whether this was just a standard sinus procedure or uh, a, a endonasal transphenoidal surgery for brain tumor. Um, a few days later, CMS allowed the ENM coding for virtual office visits. And um, only a few days after that did the state close all the beaches and parks. And um, this is when we started to have some more of our clinical trials. And there were mandates uh, voluntarily allowing uh, physicians to cover other types of practices uh, with the potential for a, a true mandate down the line should the need be there um, uh, and capacity be an issue. And finally, March 27th, uh, the CARES Act was, was passed by Congress. Um, this, uh, I'm sure many of you had seen this, this came out about March 20, um, 20th, I believe, uh, that showed that the countries that were doing better in controlling this pandemic, those were mask wearing uh, cultures and, and mask akin cultures. And those that were having a hard time, like the European cultures, um, were not typically wearing masks. And so we had mandatory face mask policies in the hospital and clinic for everybody involved. And shortly thereafter, the county mandated it for, for everybody ambulating outside. 
by uh, April, uh, April 2nd, we had a 72 hour turnaround for our lab test. And then thankfully that has improved to a less than 24 hour turnaround time. April 3rd, we uh, canceled all of our elective cases mandatorily. And also interestingly, uh, early tracheostomies were canceled in the ICU, which was a, a typical protocol we had, but again, a concern for um, the caregiver's health. But interestingly, shortly thereafter, there were models suggesting that we would be behind the curve by the beginning of May, and we wanted to be able to open the hospital and the um, operating room in particular back up for our patients who had been waiting for the month that we had shut down the elective operations and the semi-urgent operations. And so um, I actually sat, uh, have sat on a task force where we are working on this uh, process. Excuse me. This is our, our cafeteria that demonstrates um, social distancing can be done um, even indoors, but uh, with the widely spaced out um, tables. And of course it affected even me personally. This is how I used to look. And of course, this is how I look now so that my N95 respirator can fit uh, over my lack of my Armenian beard. We've implemented uh, protocols to determine which patients uh, need the test and which patients can wait. Thankfully, now that the test is becoming more prevalent and we have kits that are much more available, this is not as much of an issue, but we still apply this uh, if we do need to triage this. And now, of course, uh, in the hospital, we're um, wearing full PPE gear uh, when we interact with uh, rule out COVID patients and actively infected COVID patients. And, and of course, there's a whole protocol for that, which um, I will not go into since it was already discussed. So where are we now? Um, the surgical committee, which is led by the chief of staff of our hospital, the CMO and, and others involved in surgery, uh, department review every single operation that's scheduled and they determine is this operation uh, necessary is it urgent or semi-urgent or can it wait because if it can wait then we don't want that patient to be utilizing an, a hospital bed and potentially even an icu bed where we would have issues with interaction with other covid positive patients um, only urgent and emergent cases can be scheduled, and the definition of that is, is somewhat fluid, but uh, really left uh, to the judgment of the uh, medical group. For true emergencies, these are patients that we cannot even wait for the test results to come back, and we do have a, a rapid turnaround test right now. For true emergencies, we assume they're COVID positive, we treat them as, as if they are, we take them to the operating room, you know, say this is an acute hemorrhage in the brain, uh, acute api, or some other, uh, you know, a rupture AAA or some other acute process. And then hopefully after the surgery, the lab results will be back and we'll be able to uh, triage this patient appropriately. But we do keep the restrictions in the operating, which, which we'll talk a little bit about. For urgent operations, well, these are things like infections, cancer operations, neurosurgical operations that have worsening neurological ex or extremity deficits and or other issues that can cause potential injury. Um, we typically will test these patients, make sure we know their COVID status and determine is this somebody who can wait until they can clear their COVID condition or should they actually proceed with the, the urgent operation. And sometimes they can't, it, it all depends. There are some anecdotal uh, reports that with the PCR test, um, uh, has a somewhat of a high negative, somewhat of a low negative predictive value. And so uh, potentially a chest CT may sometimes be uh, helpful in the diagnosis of this. So we are uh, assessing chest CT results in those patients we are suspicious uh, may have the virus. And of course, uh, we have the ability now uh, to reprocess our N95 masks. This is allowed for increased availability for all of our caregivers. We use the hydrogen peroxide reprocessing, although there are other ways to reprocess this. And uh, these masks can be reprocessed up to 20 times before they, they have to be discarded. And this allows uh, for a lot more availability for all of our staff. With regards to PPE, this is actually um, a statement that came out from China in February, how they were handling the rationing of their PPE. And of course they had different tiers in the approach to managing their PPE utilization. 
And the level three uh, protection was really um, involved in patients who were undergoing aerosol generating procedures. And we'll talk a bit about this because I think this is a, an important discussion point. Um, and, and, and I think even though it's repetitive to what Dr. Avedisian said, I think this is important to discuss. So what are aerosol generating procedures? So any invasive tracheal, oral, esophageal, and or nasal procedure. So these are typically done by, by um, physicians or surgeons. Um, so intubation, bronchoscopy, um, tracheostomy suction, uh, tracheostomy placement, any oral or nasal endoscopic procedure, transesophageal echocardiography, and pretty much every ENT operation um, falls under this. Um, respiratory treatments that can aer cause aerosolization. So this is actually more on the nursing side and, and at the bedside, op opening a ventilator circuit, nebulized treatments, uh, high flow uh, nasal cannula oxygen therapy, continuous aerosol treatments, CPAP and BiPAP, RT interventions, and even CPR. So everybody is, can be exposed to this. And even outside of the clinical care, even during an, an autopsy, um, there has been reported uh, transmission of disease. So we really have to be very careful uh, on these types of aerosol generating procedures and to wear the appropriate uh, protection uh, when we do these. Um, our, our hospital system has stated that these uh, three procedures do not uh, generate AGPs. So this is a vaginal delivery, toilet flushing, and nasopharyngeal swap collection. This was just as a policy statement um, to answer some of the questions from the public. So we did mention the endonasal operation uh, that could cause transmission of the virus to the caregivers. And I think this is an interesting story and we should, we should learn a little bit more about it. This came from one case in China uh, this was an index case where there was a um, SARS-CoV positive patient, which actually was diagnosed post-op to have this. He, had, he developed uh, fevers three days after surgery. He had an endonasal operation for a pituitary macroadenoma that was causing vision loss. And he quickly developed uh, the COVID crisis, including the cytokine storm, and was transferred out of this particular hospital to another hospital, after which he unfortunately expired. However, what came out of this, and, and a lot of this information was transmitted thanks to social media to the rest of the world, um, was that 14 caregivers were affected, were infected with COVID shortly after the operation. And some of those were actually in the operating room. And so this actually alarmed many people. Um, thankfully, all of these individuals survived. But um, this was also uh, supported by anecdotal information from Iran, Italy, Greece, and the United Kingdom. And so as a result, um, we as a society and, and we as, as a health system have recommended at the minimum uh, an N95 respirator for endonasal operations. And of course, if they can be postponed uh, or done differently, that certainly is, is a possibility um, and should be considered. Uh, and it, it, there are certain hospitals, particularly in, in New York, where they have such a high COVID exposure, where these operations are just not being done unless they absolutely have to go. And, and even then, that's a, a quite a steep ask. So uh, I thought this was really interesting. Even more interesting was that just only a few days ago, the surgeons involved in this operation in China published a rebuttal statement in our journal that stated that nobody who was in the operating room actually did contract the COVID virus. Um, but then actually talking to the uh, other individuals through social media, that may actually not be ac ac accurate or correct. Um, so we're still trying to learn what's actually happening there, but certainly there's enough anecdotal information to suggest that endonasal operations have a, a very high risk of transmitting uh, COVID uh, to the caregivers. So how do we approach these patients? So for low risk operative patients, so this would be somebody who has a negative COVID PCR, who is asymptomatic, and we're performing a low risk operation, a non aerosol generating operation, then a typical surgical preparation, surgical mask eye protection, which of course I'm not wearing here, um, is, is adequate. However, for high risk operative patients, so they either are positive for COVID, or they're symptomatic with the with uh, influenza-like illness symptoms, 
or it's a high risk operation or a combination of these, and these are aerosol generating procedures, then of course the um, non-anesthesia personnel are out of the room during intubation and extubation. P PE is at least an N95 respirator with uh, reprocessing taking place as I mentioned, um, or a uh, powered air purifying respirator or PAPR. And, and some people like myself like the belts and suspenders approach because why not? We have them, might as well use them uh, to use both in the same setting. And this was a case where I performed uh, a patient who had an endonasal CSF leak that was spontaneous in its origin, um, who actually um, had ground glass findings on the CT scan. And even though the PCR was negative, we weren't ready to take the risk that maybe the chest CT was just a, a, an incidental finding. And thankfully she didn't have it and she did fine. But uh, again, this is, this is the concern we have um, people ask me how is it to operate in these, and, and anybody who's worn a PAPR knows that it can be uncomfortable. Um, it was quite uncomfortable because basically you're having dry air circulated around your sinuses and it can cause some, some issues like uh, I developed some headaches and sinus congestion. Um, but actually it is not difficult to do the operation itself. And since we didn't need to use a microscope, um, we were able to use the face shields without any problems with this endoscopic procedure. And all of these uh, methods have allowed us to, at least in our uh, judgment, flatten the curve. And this is an example of one of our hospitals where we think we are, are reaching that. And we're also conserving, uh, conserving our resources and limiting exposure to our, our caregivers. And even having some successes where uh, patients are leaving the hospital. For example, this was an LAPD detective who was in the hospital for a couple of weeks, really sick, and was able to finally leave the hospital uh, just a few days ago. And so here we are, uh, much like the people in line at Costco waiting for uh, the doors to open, um, there are a backlog of patients now who need surgery. And we have uh, this issue that we will need to deal with in the short uh, interval. So there are a number of different approaches and um, Dr. Um, and Rafi had mentioned this uh, very nicely, but um, I'd like to delve a little bit more into this. So this was a recommendation from the Amer American College of Surgeons. I think this is the most comprehensive recommendation and it appears that the CMS and the CDC recommendations come from this uh, recommendation. So of course, number one is COVID-19 awareness. Know your, your community and your hospital's COVID numbers because not every community is the same. Of course, highly uh, populated cities may be different than, than rural areas. And even within a, a large city, there may be differences within the different hospitals as to what type of patients there are and how, what the exposure is. Also know your diagnostic testing availability. Do you have enough resources and kits to perform this and have a timely results back uh, to take care of these patients? Uh, promulgate uh, PPEs for everybody involved in, in healthcare. And, and we, we, I think, finally have, have reached this after some challenges with supply chain. Um, know our health healthcare facility capacity, whether uh, there are enough ICU beds, ventilators, um, how we're going to manage patients in, on the weekend. There's talks about opening the OR all seven days for elective operations, which is not typically the case, but we, we do see a need. Uh, ensure OR supply chain and support areas, address work staffing issues, particularly those that may be in quarantine, and of course have a governance committee which, which we've established. Patient issues are also um, an, uh, a factor, and, and I think it's very important to have good, solid patient communication. I found in my practice that most, pa most patients do not want to go to the hospital right now. They don't want to deal with anything with the COVID issue, so they're very happily delaying operations, but at some point they will want to come back in, and uh, it'll be important to have those discussions, and then which patients are prioritized over the next, and we'll talk a little bit about that with the different subspecialties. And of course, delivery of high quality and safe health care, uh, making sure that um, all of the five phases of care are, are delivered properly. So this was the CMS um, statement, which is very similar with some minor tweaks. And this is for the phase one reopening of America, which includes the healthcare care uh, reopening. Um, and of course, uh, you can read this. Um, it's very similar uh, to what we just talked about but uh, again, following the guidelines from the ACS. This is an example of one flowchart uh, to approach the uh, patients uh, uh, that we were trying to bring in uh, for elective surgery. And I think this is a very interesting um, 
an important set of criteria, and I want to spend a little bit more time on this. This is from the CMS. There are three tiers that they've developed, very similar to what we saw with the UCSF four-tiered system uh, to approach patients on their ramp down. This is for the ramp up. So um, tiers one, two, and three, and we'll go through each of them separately. So tier one are low acuity uh, treatment or services. So uh, medical office uh, locations, uh, federally qualified uh, uh, healthcare clinics, rural healthcare clinics, hospital outpatient, department, outpatient departments. And these are routine things, routine primary specialty care, preventative visits, wellness visits, things like that. So these, I think, would be well recognized to postpone until we're, we're fully operational. A tier two are intermediate acuity or, or treatment uh, services. So really, if we don't provide this treatment, there's a potential for increasing morbidity or mortality in the patient. And these it could include vaccinations, newborn early uh, childhood care, and I think we'll be hearing more about this tomorrow in the pediatric lectures. Follow-up management of existing uh, medical or behavioral issues, uh, evaluation of new symptoms and urgent or, or sorry and non-urgent symptoms. And these patients, we would like to still apply the telehealth uh, model if if we can, and if we cannot then we bring them in. Uh, and uh, I, th I think we've been very successful in implementing this, at, le at least through our institution. And finally, tier three, these are the high acuity treatment or service. So lack of in-person uh, treatment or evaluation would result in harm to the patient. And so these include new symptoms, new patients um, that could be consistent with COVID-19 or not, um, and would not recommend postponing these. So how do these uh, roll out? Uh, it, it depends on the specialty, depends on the, um, the situation at hand. I think a very important statement came from the Ambulatory Surgery Center Association. Um, they're of course been at the front line of, of this and they were one of the, the last to close down their elective procedures. And of course, very interested in ramping back up um, due to the uh, staffing issues but they did recommend delaying elective operations for six to eight weeks. This, you can see the statement from uh, over a month ago, um, using uh, resources sparingly and uh, wisely and working with hospitals, uh, particularly with resource management and, and staff management. But they did develop this multi-tiered system and uh, I won't go into details, but you can see how a uh, low acuity issue basically, basically should be postponed, but things like um, low risk cancer, non-urgent spine, uh, intermediate acuity patients may be somebody you may not want to postpone. And of course, high acuity operations like many cancer operations, uh, emergent operations, and, and of course, uh, symptomatic uh, and worsening symptom patients should not be postponed, and, but should likely be done at a hospital setting and not an ASC. This was uh, from the uh, American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons, and they also have categorized the uh, emergent uh, down to the elective uh, procedures. And you can read here that an emergent would be things like compartment syndrome and fractures, dislocations, down to electives, which are more like uh, total joint replacement, knee replacement, et cetera, which can certainly wait. The American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, our ENT colleagues, have a whole protocol with how they are approaching the, ENT, uh, the patients in their clinic. They do a lot of procedures in clinic that are not regulated in an operating room, uh, but still have a high risk of transmission of COVID uh, to themselves and to others. So they do follow this protocol. Um, but I'll skip to the, um, the tiers of uh, procedures. So low risk, Things are like ear infections, skin infections, vertigo, those things really don't need too much protection. Any sort of endoscopy, um, minor procedures recommend masks and gloves. And anything that can cause a cough or sneeze is recommended by this society uh, to wear mask, gowns, gloves, and of course, wipe down afterwards. So somewhat similar to what we're, we're seeing elsewhere. And then finally, what we've been working on uh, in our institution is our neurological surgery approach. Um, which is, uh, uh, this is specifically for brain tumors. And you can imagine that there are a number of patients with various types of brain tumors that would need operations, but they can, some can wait and some cannot. We're excluding the emergent cases like the hemorrhagic tumors and malignancies like metastatic tumors and uh, glioblastoma, but we're including things like 
meningiomas that may be causing neurological deficits and also uh, other types of tumors, for example, pituitary tumors that we, we would operate through the nose. And you can see a tier one, um, we uh, do not recommend PP, uh, respirators as PPE after intubation. These are uh, healthy patients who have a benign cranial approach. Um, certainly we want to have the patient, uh, the, the practitioners exit the room during in, intubation because that's still possible. And we do wait for an air exchange of at least one or two air exchanges, which is about four to 12 minutes. Um, we do incorporate the ASA grade. What, the reason we did this is because if you do have an a unhealthy patient, they have a higher likelihood of reaching the intensive care unit after surgery. We still don't want to overload the intensive care unit you know, in this COVID situation. And then of course the tier four are the high risk operations, the endonasal operations that we wanna make sure we have negative COVID tests as well as other confirmatory tests before we uh, operate on these patients, especially when it's elective. So um, to conclude, a flattened curve means this plant pandemic will be with us. It'll be a long and slow process. The stay at home social distancing works and we should all abide by it. PPE should be used at all times when uh, interacting with others, and in particular in high-risk situations, should be N95 or PAPRs for aerosol generating procedures or COVID positive patients. We should conserve and reuse or reprocess PPE when possible, and I think those uh, systems are starting to come into place better. And then plan for a tiered based strategy to resume operations and clear the backlog of cases. And as Dr. Avetisian mentioned, stay physically and mentally healthy for you and your family and your patients, because if you're sick, you're not gonna be able to take care of anybody else. And finally, I'd like to thank everybody involved in the front lines, our families, our nurses, our, our critical care uh, physicians, anesthesiologists, uh, and everybody really working hard to take care of uh, these patients. And uh, hopefully we'll all get through this in, in a very healthy and, and safe way. Thank you very much. And, and hopefully we can have some questions to answer. Dr. Barkhudaryam, thank you very much for that very informative presentation. Um, we will now ask um, Dr. Atisian to reactivate your video, please. And um, there we go, and we will take some questions. So we encourage everybody to present your questions. Um, you can write them in the Q&A, or you can also write them in the chat. We already had some questions. Dr. Cherik uh, commented that recently there has been reports showing that intubation in COVID-19 patients has been associated with lower chance of survival. In fact, uh, up to 80% mortality rate what are your thoughts? And uh, Rafi, if you can unmute your microphone. Yes, um, that is correct. When the patients do go downhill all the way to um, being needed to intubation, they are in acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, regardless of a COVID uh, or not, acute respiratory distress syndrome, as I said, is a, is a grave situation overall the mortality is high. Having said that, you are comparing a patient uh, which may have a chance, be it as low as 20%, compared to a patient which has a much lower, maybe no chance of uh, survival with not intub being intubated. So yes, uh, our responsibility is to do uh, the best we can and go for, for the fight as far as we can and yes, we have to intubate if we have to intubate. Yes, indeed. Um, we had a, another comment in, from, uh, uh, I believe this is a physician in Armenia who said, thank you. Hope we can organize one more lecture on pediatric anesthesiologists and intensivists. And uh, of course we are conducting these uh, training webinars. Uh, for physicians in Armenia who are on the front lines um, they're, that are tailored specifically to their needs. And we, we have another one coming up with anesthesia. So we'll uh, please look forward to that. Um, uh, Rafi, I'd like to ask you in terms of 
shortages of various medications that are used in, you know, induction or let's say even in sedation. These are in, you know, uh, MAC cases or, or conscious sedation. Um, we've heard from some of our colleagues here that, you know, there are shortages of propofol that are being used for you know, patients who are remaining to be intimated for a prolonged time. What's your experience been in Ohio? Yes, that is true. We have already started uh, uh, thinking about how to preserve, conserve those medications that could be and should be used for sedation in the, uh, the intubated patients. Uh, there, there is a, a lot of common sense uh, coming into a portion of that, including using lo uh, smaller bottles than opening a big bottle um, for, let's say, propofol if the need is uh, smaller. Um, it also goes to other modalities of sedation, as well as decreasing the pain, for example, going to uh, regional anesthesia for some of the, the um, procedures that we have to do to use uh, less of a sedation. Um, and as well as we do have other medications, which uh, we need uh, to read the pharmacology of it to be able to use it. Propofol is very easy to use. Uh, there you go, you give it. Um, but there are other medications as well. We just have to be conscientious of what we're using. Very good. We have a question for Dr. Barhudaryan. Uh, would you be able to provide a source to the mask reprocessing protocol article procedure that you are using? I think that would be very helpful as we're experiencing um, shortage of PPE still. And I, I, I believe that may become even more pronounced as more procedures are open, more uh, elective procedures are beginning to be done. If you could share that link, uh, perhaps in the chat, or we can send it out in an email form. I can I can help with that. We can send it out probably later on as an email. Uh, there are different ways of doing this. We use the hydrogen peroxide reprocessing system. It's done as a batch, so there's a big machine downstairs, and the uh, uh, SPD guys take care of it. Um, I also understand uh, from my colleagues at USC that they use a laser reprocessing system for their N95s. And so uh, they're using that type of system. But I'll try to get both of those uh, links out to you guys. Yeah. And there is a publication out of Duke University. If, if uh, uh, Robert, if you perhaps you can Google it. I did the same uh, a few days ago. Uh, Duke University published the various methods and a step-by-step -step way and I believe they listed three methods, hydrogen peroxide being one of them. There was also another way using uh, ultraviolet light. Um, and, and, and another um, method which we learned from our nursing colleagues is that um, they reuse the N95 masks, but every three to four days. So they, they are uh, issued three or four different N95 masks. They use one for the day. Once they're done with that mask, they place it in a paper bag, write the date and put that mask away. And if that mask theoretically had any virus on it, it would be dead in, a, in two, two days. So they if used uh, every fourth day, then theoretically that mask should be, uh, uh, had self disinfected, so to speak. Uh, we have another question since we know that this disease is not classic ARDS, but in fact, primary hypoxic vasoconstriction, secondary to cytokine storm. Are you seeing a change in management by your intensivist or anesthesia colleagues? I guess that's for me. Um, Susie, I, I do agree. Um, having said that, I'm thinking of how can I explain a classic ARDS? ARDS is at the end spectrum of any uh, pathophysiologic process that comes to the point that there is a big VQ mismatch, ventilation to perfusion mismatch. And yes, that could be because of a hypoxic vasoconstriction uh, because of the, cycle, the cytokine storm. But what happens anyway, we have a VQ mismatch. There is not enough uh, oxygen absorption because there's no blood there and the oxygen goes somewhere that there's no blood there. That's probably why uh, the, uh, some of the um, management protocols, including the prone positioning, 
may work. But yes, there are different, uh, about 22 different protocols are being used uh, um, for infection control and uh, cytokine control. Um, having said that, at the end of the day, it is an ARDS. And as of now, we have a treatment which includes the intubation, positive airway, uh, positive index periphery pressure, and the minimum FIOD that can keep the patient's um, uh, oxygen to about 20, 92%, as well as uh, uh, some hypercapnia uh, if, if we can. So yes, but on the other hand, as of now, this is what we have. So I am just placing the link for the uh, reuse of the mask in the chat. So if uh, Robert, you can please feel free to access that. Um, now, as we're waiting for more questions, uh, I'd like to say that, yes, go ahead, uh, Garni. I have a question for Rafi. Uh, I, uh, I've read recently that uh, some of the pathophysiology for the hypoxia is not really oxygen exchange, but rather delivery from on a hemoglobin level. And, and uh, there's concern that the virus can affect the hemoglobin much like cyanide would or carbon monoxide. Have you heard that? Is that something that's valid? And, and, and are there strategies that are different than we would typically employ for ARDS? Well, anecdotally, yes. Um, in fact, interestingly, someone from Armenia was saying, oh, the, the saturation seems that this is just like uh, the, the toxicity, cyanide toxicity. Can I put the patients in hyperbaric oxygen? Uh, but having said that, any, uh, um, uh, any, any uh, inflammatory process within the body, be it infection, being sepsis or whatever, does decrease release of oxygen from hemoglobin. So partly yes, but having said that, even not even the saturation of hemoglobin itself, but the PaO2, which is a partial pressure of oxygen inside the blood, is also low. So I, I think both, uh, and uh, the part that oxygen does not get saturated, the hemoglobin does not get saturated because of the inflammatory response of the whole body. Yeah, we have, you know, there, there have been several uh, questions in regards to that. In fact, we've reached out to some of our uh, hematology colleagues and we do have uh, scheduled as a part of the series of hematology talk where um, we're gonna be discussing some of the changes that occur with hemoglobin, with iron levels and the, the iron deposition in the liver and some of the impacts that it's been having. In addition to that, some uh, hypercoagulable issues and, and microthrombi and so on. Those would be really very interesting uh, things to learn about as, as there's new things that are going. Yes, Rafi. And in continuation, um, we do concentrate a lot on the oxygen. And it's very, very important, don't get me wrong. But this is a multi-organ failure problem. Um, in fact, we all of a sudden realize that we're putting so much attention on the oxygenation that we may not have enough, uh, 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 enough uh, dialysis machines to uh, get rid of the, uh, the kidney problem that they have. So it's, it's a lot vaster than what we think only on oxygenation or other uh, organ uh, failures as well. Yeah. And I would also add alongside those those points that, that it, it is starting to show some effect in the CNS. We have seen some potential cases of meningitis, viral meningitis related to this, post-viral conditions um, like uh, transverse myelitis possibly, we're still investigating this. There's some reports that this can enter into the brainstem. Um, so uh, it's hard to say how true that is. I think we'll, we'll see some reports in the next few months about that, but I think it is affecting pretty much every organ that we have. So we have another question that says, have you seen any strategies that focus on preserving endothelial function 
promoting perfusion and decreasing pulmonary pressures such as NTG? Uh, uh, th again, I think that's, that's for me, Susie. This is, uh, you're, you're talking about nitroglycerin probably, is that right? Um, to answer the question, I don't know of any current strategies. I know there are some, uh, 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 some trials, um, but again, that's part of the problem. Uh, just alveolus being full of stuff that doesn't let the oxygen reach the endothelium uh, of the alveolus is a, a huge problem. Uh, and that's all because of this rush of this uh, cytokines, as you said, as an inflammatory processes that's happening there. Um, no, if you can enlighten us, I'll uh, be happy to, to listen to that, but I don't know of any, any specific strategy with the nitroglycerin um, or for that sense, a nitric oxide or anything that can uh, cause with dilation or alveolar dilation, I don't know. Thank you, Susie, for that question. Um, and just to uh, reiterate that, you know, there are CME credits being offered for this. You can go to amsc.org and uh, participate in the activities, uh, answer the questions and claim your credits. Also, uh, these talks are being archived and you can find them on our website. Um, again, go to our website. There's a tab for webinars. You'll be able to watch it at any time. Uh, claim your CME as well. Also, we would love your feedback. Several of you have contacted us with feedback. Uh, we very much so appreciate that. Um, and um, essentially, uh, you know, hear from you, our CME. Uh, we'll go back to the drawing board and try to bring back, um, um, uh, try to, you know, bring you the most uh, pertinent and uh, active information. Truly, we've, we've used this time to refocus and reassess what we're doing, but our mission has remained the same and we're, we're dedicated to that uh, more than ever. Um, yes, this is a little bit of a, you know, uh, uncertain times, but it's only served to strengthen our, our resolve towards our mission. And in fact, we've been able to strengthen some of the connections, some of our global connections throughout the diaspora. Rafi is joining us from uh, Cleveland. He is a, you know, world-renowned expert in the field, um, is very active, you know, in Armenia as worked um, with many, uh, many of us here, including Dr. Baruch Udaryan. Um, and it's it, these times we are really reaching in, rolling up our sleeves and trying to bring the latest information for all of us here, whoever's interested in participating, as well as we're doing these activities on a regular basis in the front lines in Armenia, where as you heard, uh, Dr. Abitisian say, in, in some regards, they're doing very well there. And, you know, Rafi, maybe you can comment a little bit on that because I know you've been in touch with the intensivists at one of the frontline hospitals. Uh, I, I think it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about your perspective of how things are going there. Well, um, well, this, what I'm saying is not scientific. Um, excuse me for that. It is most of an observation, it looks like people in Armenia do listen to the government and uh, they are keeping the social distancing very well. Um, I am very happy to say compared to some other places that I do uh, see in Armenia, the, the, the rate of growth is much lower. Um, number two, I just heard there's more than one innovation. They, they come up with innovative methods of decreasing the contact, bringing in oxygen, uh, putting up cylinders, and proud to say one of the most active diaspora in the whole world is Armenian. Look at what the uh, Armenian American Medical Society is doing with these CMEs and keeping in touch. But specifically, as I said, some of the protocols that they have been using, including prone positioning without intubation, um, including using uh, some of the medication, like plaquenil with uh, imipenem, 
Mary Penham that I heard the other day, they, they were doing, it looks like it's working great. And they have very good answers. We were on the OMIC joint call with the, the Deputy Minister of uh, Health, uh, Health uh, Anahit Ronisi uh, the other day. And they are having continuous uh, uh, contacts with different hospitals and the protocols that they are sharing. I think they're doing a great job. Uh, sometimes uh, I, I feel like I have to listen to them. We can, yes. may I add a, a couple of thoughts myself? Um, part of the reason I, I spent a little bit of time on the stay at home on my slides uh, is because I have heard a lot of stories, not, not only in the United States where I showed some examples, but also um, elsewhere in the world, including it's very pr prominent in Russia. And I've also heard about this in Armenia where the stay at home mandates are, are being ignored. And uh, I was just talking to a neurosurgery colleague of mine yesterday, and he was telling me that people are out on the streets again, and it's, they're just taking a step back. So I, I'd urge every physician who's listening to this, every caregiver who's listening to this to really um, pound that message to everybody that it works and we need to follow it and we can't just think it's a ploy. I've heard from friends of mine here that it's just a tactic and it's a political issue and nobody believes it until it happens to them. So I, I really encourage that it is up to us to pass that knowledge uh, on to our colleagues and our friends and our neighbors to make sure we're all staying safe here and uh, across the world. Yeah, Gar Garni, there was a line I would like to, to quote from, from uh, one of the intensivists in Armenia. Uh, I think she's a hero, uh, Dr. Gaine Juanisi. Uh, um, hasn't been home for more than a month. Uh, has been in the hospital day in, day out, 24 hours a day, trying to save people. And at the end of the interview, she had mentioned in Armenian, and I'm translating, please stay home so we can go home as well. So I'm sitting at home. I'm, it's, this, is, this is nothing compared to, to some of the, the physicians on the front line here in the United States, in a lot of places in the world, including Italy including Spain or other places, as well as on me. I mean, people, listen to them. Listen to your doctors. Stay at home so they can go home as well. Yeah. Well said. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I'd like to take this moment to thank both of you for the outstanding um, you know, presentations and the great practical advice that uh, you know, this webinar was very well attended. It's also broadcasting on Facebook Live. Um, I'm sure that we were going to get a lot of positive feedback. Um, also, uh, please, um, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to continue to participate in these events. We have another one that's coming, uh, coming up tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Uh, it, it will be on pediatrics and COVID-19. Uh, we have uh, Garni's better half, uh, Evelyn Barhudarian, who will be presenting along with Alice Abramian, both uh, pediatricians. Um, on Thursday night, we um, ask everybody to uh, put that in on your calendars. At 7 p.m., we're going to have a special virtual town hall meeting. Uh, our president, Dr. Kevin Galstian, will be uh, hosting uh, U.S. Congressman Adam Schiff in a virtual town hall with a Q&A and uh, uh, Congressman Schiff is going to tell us a little bit on the uh, uh, federal government's perspective uh, on what's being done, uh, especially to uh, the constituents here in Southern California, uh, specifically as pertaining to the, uh, some of the healthcare professionals. Uh, we encourage all of you to, you know, participate in that and, uh, you know, direct your questions, plan your questions, and it really will be a dynamic Q&A session. With that, um, thank you very much, everyone, for being there. Please, please listen to what Dr. Avedisian said, Dr. Barhudarian said. Uh, don't let up. Let's all stay home. Let's all be safe as much as possible. Um, you know, uh, this is going to pass. It's not, it's a challenge, but it's not insurmountable. We're going to get through it. It's a matter of perspective. In fact, in many aspects, it's made us stronger. It's made us better. It's tightened some of our connections. 
and enabled some new connections. So just uh, let's, let's stick together and we're gonna get through this. In the meantime, let's get together over Zoom and have these discussions, share these ideas, share each other's knowledge. And, uh, you know, and most importantly, as both doctors said, don't forget to take care of yourselves so that we can best take care of our loved ones and our patients. Anyway, have a great evening and we'll see you again tomorrow night. Please be safe and stay healthy. Good night. Good night. Thank you.